world in the mid-80s is girdled by pictures, showering down from more than 60 satellites. Television for hundreds of millions of viewers. And today, a whole new generation of television satellites is about to lift off as the opening salvo in a global television revolution. The new race for television is about to begin. Only 60 years ago, the first race for television had a less spectacular beginning. This is one of the first surviving television images. The year is 1928. Just eight years later, the race for television was won and lost by the man who led the way and recorded this picture. The station goes on the air. November the 2nd, 1936, the world's first modern television broadcast. This is the opening of BBC TV, the first regular public television service on Earth with high-definition pictures and a schedule of programmes, two hours a day, six days a week. Only about 2,000 viewers saw this opening broadcast, but it signalled the end of an extraordinary international race for television that obsessed a handful of pioneers from Tokyo to Berlin and from San Francisco and Leningrad to London. This program is the story of that race. From the beginning, television begins to establish the patterns of power familiar today. A power which drew from John Reith, the BBC's first director general, the prediction that TV might soon become a social menace of the first magnitude. Wonderful thing, television. Television was born to a tiny audience. But it was from the very beginning a surprisingly vigorous infant. Long before television became a reality, it was established as a tantalizing idea. For the most part, it remained the territory of cartoonists with a taste for entertaining prophecy. A century ago, the French artist Robida scored a striking number of hits. A woman undresses on the screen. Television will provide education. It will also provoke sex and violence. And it will bring to our homes the horror of war. But television soon became more than a topic for futuristic cartoons. In the race which was about to begin, many contenders have their champions today. Baird definitely was the very first to successfully demonstrate television. And he said very quietly to me, I've come to tell you that I have achieved television. Electronic TV was first invented by our own countryman, Professor Boris Leibovich Rosing, in 1907. Germany was, in fact, the first country to begin an expanded service. The idea was that we were trying to beat the British uh, to get a uh, continuing service of television on the air. 
At that moment, I was very, very happy, and I said to myself, now for the very first time, we have the basis of television. And all these great minds were working night and day. It was a kind of an international race. Which of these men was to win that race to invent television is still a matter of debate and national pride. But already, a hundred years ago, the race was on. From the 1880s, a series of pioneering inventions and experiments in Russia, Germany, America, France, and the United Kingdom opened the way for television. More than 50 serious proposals for distant seeing were documented by the 1920s. But already, a fundamental division had emerged between two methods for making television pictures, which was to split the contenders in the race for TV and fuel some of its most bitter arguments. Some pioneers insisted that television would have to be electronic and based on the recently invented cathode ray tube. Others were equally committed to the idea of mechanical television. This is the heart of mechanical TV, the Nipkoff disc. Spinning at high speed inside the TV camera and also in the home receiver, its basic limitations and crude pictures were to prove disastrous for its supporters. By the early 1920s, the contenders in the television race were working in at least half a dozen centers around the world, in Europe, America, the Soviet Union, and Japan. In Britain, television had attracted an improbable enthusiast with a talent for showmanship. We introduce Mr. John Baird, the inventor. This is the scanning disc with its lenses. This is the second disc by which the light is further divided and passes into the light cell. John Logie Baird was a restless, charming Scotsman who'd already shrugged off several careers by the time he began to experiment with television in the early 1920s, at the age of 34. The inventor of the Baird undersock, the entrepreneur who had dabbled with chutney in the West Indies, artificial diamonds in Glasgow and soap in London, turned his unusual energies to seeing by wireless in 1923, as he announced in the Times personal column. From the start, Baird was totally committed to the idea of mechanical television and dismissed the electronic system. It was to prove ultimately a disastrous decision. In Britain, the race for television began unpromisingly here in Hastings in February 1923. For radio dealer Victor Mills, it began with a knock on his door from a strange Scotsman. He was dressed in an old raincoat. Certainly didn't look as though he'd owned anything. And he said, um, I fitted up an, an apparatus for transmitting pictures, television. And he says, I can't get it to go. Well, I arranged to go and see him. So I went down there. The um, workshop proper didn't exist. Um, <laughs> He had a collection of junk. That's what he boils down to. Now, quite truly, I wouldn't have given two pounds for the lot. The creator of the junk was John Logie Baird. Wood from coffins, darning needles, hat boxes, ceiling wax, and a cycle lamp lens joined a spinning disc cut from an old tea chest. But for all the laughable crudeness of the equipment, Victor Mills was about to share with Baird in a historic moment. And I put my hand in front of the neon, just to flick. But in the meantime, Baird yelled out, it's here, it's here. This image, reconstructed here, was the first time anyone had achieved an instantaneous moving picture anywhere in the world. Characteristically, Baird speedily began to give demonstrations to the press. But equally characteristically, he was thrown out of his rooms in Hastings for causing explosions. He soon moved to London, where he continued his experiments in Soho and employed his charm to try to raise money and support. Desperately hard up, he looked for sponsors. By March 1925, 
Baird found an improbable partner in Selfridge's department store, who were looking for a gimmick to attract customers. Among the crowd was a schoolgirl, Elizabeth Wood. And then Mr. Baird came in. He um, really gave us a demonstration of all the apparatus and told us how it happened. And then it came on, and it was a little disappointing, really, because there were black lines sort of wiggling across it. And it jumped up and down. And then we all um, clapped rather politely, because we were all on the front of the television. I think the trouble was that we believe that if they could make this film, they could see into our houses. We could see them, they could see us. Baird reports how at this time in his Soho laboratory, he had little money for equipment, less for food, and none at all for clothes. But his experiments prospered. He transmitted across a room a cardboard face with a winking eye. And since the scorching heat of his lights and the rigidity he needed from his models was too much for a human sitter, he used a ventriloquist dummy called Stuckey. By the autumn of 1926, his original one-yard transmission in Hastings had stretched to eight miles, and Baird had scraped together his own company, Television Limited. But in the international race for television, other contenders were also making progress. In Japan, by 1926, a young engineer was experimenting with electronic television. Kenshiro Takayanagi recalls how he was very conscious of the race. I thought, I'm also doing serious research into television and I must never let the other countries beat me. I have to get something done very quickly. I decided that to begin with, I would try to transmit the Japanese letter E. Then very soon, a really good image appeared and I knew that I was able to show the character E on my screen. In the Soviet Union, the race for television was also making progress in the late 1920s. Alongside the massive social upheaval in the years following the revolution, Soviet scientists quickly solved the basic problems of producing television pictures. This, in essence, is the first television picture obtained by us as long ago as 1928. While an experimental studio was set up in Leningrad working with mechanical TV, major developments in electronic television were being made in Tashkent as early as 1926. For the time being, radio was the new popular miracle. While some Soviet scientists had left revolutionary Russia to continue the television race in the West. In America, Vladimir Zvorykin, one of the emigre pioneers from the Soviet Union committed to electronic television, found his new ideas weren't immediately popular in the early 20s with his American boss at the Westinghouse Company. He wasn't very impressed. So finally he asked me a few questions, mostly how long did I work with this system and so on, and departed, saying a few words to the director of the laboratory. Later on I found out that what he said was, put his guy to work on something more useful. Zvorykin soon went to work for the huge and powerful RCA company and its boss, another Russian emigre, David Sarnov. America's crucial link between big business and television was quickly forged. Sarnov, a pioneer of radio in America, was already delivering visionary pronouncements about TV's potential. He announced, the whole country will join in every national procession. He also predicted that television would transform human relations but Sarnoff had already seen the work of a serious rival, a young American who was to be his bitter opponent in the race for TV over the next decade. Today, 200 Green Street, San Francisco, is a historic monument. Elma Farnsworth remembers how it was almost 60 years ago when her late husband pioneered electronic television here. It was 1927, 
and Philo T. Farnsworth was just 20. His widow also recalls his dedication to television revealed on their wedding night. He said, you know, uh, there's another woman in my life. And I said, uh, well, I didn't say anything. I was so dumbstruck. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, her name is television. And in order to have enough time together, I want you to work with me. And he said, uh, uh, we're going to be working right on the edge of discovery, and it's going to be very exciting, and I want you to be part of it. Television is about to emerge from the laboratory to bring into your home news, entertainment, and material of educational value. RCA soon tried to buy out Farnsworth. He flatly refused. But his first demonstration to his sponsors in May 1928 suggested Farnsworth's problems. One of his backers was a banker called Daddy Fagan. Mr. Fagan called out and he said, when are we going to see some dollars in this thing, Farnsworth? And immediately a dollar sign appeared on the screen. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in London, Baird was still developing his mechanical TV. It was still cumbersome and noisy, and he was still in money trouble. By 1928, Baird televisors were being advertised for between 20 and 150 pounds. But most enthusiasts bought his kits for just 16 guineas. It was time for a bold gimmick. It is interesting to note that as far back as 1928, I spanned the Atlantic with television. In an attempt to raise publicity and sales, Baird succeeded in February 1928 in sending a television picture from London to New York. Shares in Baird's company boomed. On the way home, he pulled off another successful stunt when his team set up their equipment aboard the SS Berengaria in mid-Atlantic and invited the ship's wireless operator to view his fiancée in the Baird London studio. The press were ecstatic, headlining Lovers Meet by Television. But there was little comment about the fact that the operator had difficulty in recognizing his fiancée. The low frequencies used for TV at the time allowed the pictures to travel much greater distances than today. But the images produced by mechanical TV remain very crude for all Baird's energies. Logie Baird's enthusiasm was so catching we would work for hours because he would be there and he'd say, I've nearly got it, I've nearly got it. And we just, we were rooting for him, you know, we wanted him to, to get it right. Um, yes, I, I think that we all saw that it was going to be something very big. We didn't know how. There was no doubt that Baird's showmanship was making people aware of the new medium. A Heath Robinson cartoon of March 1928 speculated about some new uses for television. For the toilet, enabling the televisioner to see the back of his head when brushing his hair. For the convenience of the angler, permitting him to keep his eye on the bait without undue exertion. A handy set for schoolmasters, enabling them, while enjoying their midday solace in quiet, to keep an eye on their pupils. A gentleman locating a missing stud with the aid of a neat dressing room television set. By the late 1920s, America was becoming a serious contender in the race. Pioneers offered some striking public demonstrations. And we'll now show you the first motion picture record of a television image. This picture was recorded and synchronized with sound in the General Electric Company's House of Magic at Schenectady, New York. Despite his flair for showmanship, there were worrying indications for Baird that he had serious rivals. Since most people have heard a great deal about television. By the late 20s, there were 18 licensed visual broadcasting stations in the USA transmitting faces and silhouettes. Excited crowds turned up at public demonstrations. Americans had produced the first TV play and the first outside broadcast. 
Television experiments would soon be progressing rapidly here in France as well as in Germany and the Soviet Union. Baird began what was to be a long and often bitter campaign to get the BBC to transmit his television. But unrecognized by Baird, and most threatening of all to his ambition to win the race, experiments in electronic television were showing great promise. In Britain, Baird's electronic rival was to be the EMI company, a well-organized group with links both to Marconi and RCA in America. At the EMI laboratories in Middlesex, the company also had the expertise of yet another brilliant emigre Russian, Isaac Schoenberg, who would soon be making great progress with electronic TV. One of EMI's engineers, Bernard Greenhead, recalls an early demonstration. Everybody seemed to be particularly pleased, and I think we were very pleased ourselves that there hadn't been any breakdowns, even. the equipment hadn't coughed at any time. And after the visitors had gone, Schoenberg went, came back into the control room and he said, well, gentlemen, you seemed to have perfected the biggest time waster of all mankind. I hope you use it well. Now tell me, sir, whether with this flower in my mouth I can sit quietly at home as this woman would have me do. July 1930. Yes, yes, at last, John Logie Baird had won a temporary victory in his battle to transmit experimental television on the BBC using his still primitive 30-line mechanical system. This is an exact reconstruction via a Baird receiver of the first play on British television, Pirandello's The Man with the Flower in His Mouth, broadcast 55 years ago. Of course, they had to adapt themselves most ingeniously to our very tiny area of operation, uh, head and shoulder views of people. Movement of artists in and out of the picture was very carefully and gently done. If you wanted a change of scene, you had to very carefully slide in a, a thing looking like a draft board, which was slid in slowly in front of the artist, and then while that was there occupying the screen, the artist would get out of the chair and the other one would get in. I was only joking. Well, well. I must be going. The very worst I might do is to kill myself. It was a miracle of television that uh, appealed to people at the very beginning. The fact that you could see anything at all. Uh, the subject matter hardly mattered, uh, hardly concerned them. It was just seeing something. Almost uh, in those very early days, when radio had only been going uh, six years, seven years, uh, even listening uh, was a thrill to many people who'd made their own sets and, and so on. And the same with television. The people who saw it at the beginning were almost only those who'd made their own sets. With Baird himself estimating that there were only 29 sets in Britain by the late 20s, advertising had plenty of scope. Sets were still as expensive as a car, and only the skillful fanatic would relish the joys of building his own television. But pursuing his publicity efforts, Baird sent one of his sets to Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald, who hailed it as a wonderful miracle. And Baird got more headlines in June 1931 by televising the Derby as a demonstration, though the pictures must have frustrated viewing punters. And all that we ever expected or could see were the horses just flashing past the winning post. And that was all rather fascinating. You wouldn't be able to tell horse, one horse from another or one jockey from another, but you could at least tell they were horses. In the international TV race, the Soviet Union was still a leading contender, beginning experimental television to a tiny audience in October 1934. When everything was ready, you heard, attention, 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 comrades, radio viewers. Note that, radio viewers. Watch, listen to the first television concert. And the radio viewers didn't have such a set. They didn't know what was going on. They tried to see something. They looked into the loudspeaker and of course, they could see nothing. And our magazine's editorial received a flood of letters Tell us where we should look. America, in the early 30s, had fallen behind in the race. In his experimental studios, Philo Farnsworth continued his electronic pioneering. 
But after an initial boom, America's fledgling TV industry faded because of commercial rivalries and because the pictures were too poor to attract advertising sponsorship. In the mid-30s, a fierce legal battle over patents developed between Sarnos RCA and Philo Farnsworth, which was to drag on for years, leaving American television in a state of suspended animation. Sarnoff still made astute prophecies about the potential power of TV. Showmanship in presenting political appeal will be more effective than mere skill in talking, he wrote. But he also urged advertisers will be given new possibilities. Technicians in the Farnsworth Philadelphia laboratories have helped to make television the dazzling dream of the decade a practical reality today. For the time being, television in the USA withdrew to the laboratories, where important developments were being made in electronic TV in great secrecy, heavily funded by companies like Farnsworth's rival, RCA, who were still determined to win the race for television. We didn't want anybody to know how well we were doing. I mean, it was sort of like a spy. Anybody would give it, give it away, the British would know and would beat us. So that was the whole purpose of that early uh, secrecy, just to make sure that we were first. From August 1932, Baird had begun a regular four-day-a-week experimental service via BBC transmitters. But the BBC became increasingly uneasy with the crude pictures as trials of the rival electronic television became more impressive. Meanwhile, if television was a problem for the engineers, it was also a trial for artists appearing on television at this period. Makeup could be a particularly messy business. In addition to all this, TV performers in mechanical TV studios often had to work in total darkness and very restricted space, scanned by a brilliant beam of light. We had uh, makeup on, they put makeup on me with black lipstick. I looked like Pola Negri or uh, Garbo years ago in silent pictures. Dancers Vera McConaughey and Gelda Waller had first hand experience of those early years and braved the hazards of the makeup routine in the Baird Experimental Studios. Paul, oh, yes, dreadful. Quite. The royal blue noses at the side of the nose and Royal blue lips and something on the cheek, I think. Yes, it's green, green, I think. And I went to a weird little studio with black and white squares on the floor and black and white squares on the wall and blinding lights and a queer makeup with blue lips. And I was going out on a date, and that was most annoying. And we looked like puddings when we looked at each other, didn't we? Mm. Yeah, quite frightening. Oh, almost very put us off our Indeed, stride. it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted the Mexican hat dance. So I had the hat there, and I had to do it on my toes, whether I liked it or not. And, uh, of course, I had to have music. By 1934, Baird's commercial backers insisted that he should take notice of the rapid developments in the rival electronic television, as demonstrated in America in Farnsworth's experimental studios. On a visit to Britain, partly to raise money for his legal battles with RCA, Farnsworth arranged a demonstration of his system for Baird. Mr. Baird was extolling his uh, method of television, and he thought that it was better than uh, Phil's and all this. And he got to, to the door of this room, and he saw, got a sight of the screen, and he became still. He f carefully and slowly advanced to it like one in, uh, mesmerized until he stood right in front of it and stood there for quite some minutes. And then he just turned and left without a word. And Phil felt very uh, badly for him because he knew that he was hearing the death knell of his pet um, method of television. Baird's sponsors paid Farnsworth $50,000 to supply the Scotsman with electronics.